his miraculous power to heal amazed. His power to feed thousands excited. And his power to raise the dead proved he was more than a prophet. These feats were signs that demonstrated Jesus was the Son of God. There have always been people who claim to be able to perform miracles, but when Jesus started performing his miracles, they were so numerous and the quality was just so impressive. And when I read about those miracles, I get a certain picture in my head. My mind fills in the blanks with what's familiar to me. As we read through the Bible, a lot of us have preconceived ideas about these locations or how these events actually took place. By traveling around, I think that going to a lot of these places will clear up a number of those misconceptions. It's important to remember that Jesus' official ministry really kicked off with a very simple but potent miracle in Cana where Jesus turns the water into wine. And from that point onward, the miracles increase in intensity and what he is doing is so different from what anyone else claims to be able to do, the crowds just continue to grow. to talk about the miracles of Jesus. And there's a place over here on the eastern side of the Sea of Galilee that you're taking us. What miracle did Jesus perform over here? This is the miracle of Jesus casting the demons into the swine, a site called Kersey. We know this event happened directly on the Sea of Galilee because we know that the swines ran down a steep embankment and into the sea. Jeremy, we've come to the eastern side of the Sea of Galilee and we've kind of climbed the hill a little bit. And I did that because I wanted us to read a passage. They came to the other side of the sea, the country of the Gerasenes. And when Jesus had stepped out of the boat, immediately there met him out of the tombs, a man with an unclean spirit. And of course we know this story as the story in which Jesus has compassion on this gentleman and heals him of his demons. Now this is a really famous story. This is the man that is possessed by legion and the other gospel accounts let us know that there were two men that were healed that day. It was during that trip over here from Capernaum when Jesus calmed the storm. And as soon as he finished healing this man, they asked him to leave and so he sailed right back. He came over here for two Gentile men across a stormy sea, which I think speaks a lot to the compassion of Jesus. We know that he cast the demons out of the man and into a herd of pigs and the herd numbering about 2,000 rushed down the steep bank into the sea and drowned into the sea. And of course you can kind of picture that whole story happening right here. It's not just a cliff that goes to the edge of the water. There was a considerable distance, at least a few hundred yards between the bottom of the embankment and the water's edge. That just changes how I've always imagined that. That herd of swine would have rushed down this really steep hill gone across this flat area and then run into the sea. Normally, an animal has a sense of self-preservation. And so even though it may have survived running down a steep embankment, it would have stopped in the plain, but these thousands of pigs didn't, which further attests to the fact that there was something controlling them other than themselves. Jesus performed signs that demonstrated that he was from God, that he had control over everything and everyone, even spiritual forces like demons. You know, the details at the beginning of Mark's account of this event are really helpful because they let us know the desperate condition that this man was in. He was separated from his family. He was living in the graveyard. He was basically living as a dead person. He was out of his mind, out of control. He was hurting himself, showing these signs of deep distress. And Jesus takes care of all of those things. So when the people come back out, he's sitting, he's clothed, he's in his right mind. It would have been a startling and a shocking sight for the people to come out of town and to see the aftermath of those animals drowning 
and to see someone who they had tried to help for so long finally healthy and in his right mind. And something that's emphasized down through the text is the begging that takes place. When Jesus gets there and Legion recognizes Jesus, he begs Jesus to spare him. And then later on, you have the townspeople begging Jesus to leave them because they're afraid of him. And then you have the man who's been healed begging to go with Jesus, the man who's finally helped him. And I think what Mark is trying to help us do in that chapter is to challenge us with how are we going to respond? Are we going to be so afraid of him that we beg him to leave like they did? Or are we going to respond as the healed man and beg to stay close to him because of what he does for us? We're standing on top of the archaeological site called Et Tel, and many people think this is ancient Bethsaida. Now there's a number of different places that could be Bethsaida. In fact, there's one right down in the valley that they're digging on right now. We came up here because I wanted to read a passage to you, and it says, On their return, the apostles told him all that they had done, and he took them and withdrew apart to a town called Bethsaida. And this is the beginning of the account of Jesus feeding the 5,000 and that probably took place right here in this plain of Bethsaida, just down below the hill where we are now. Now, it's helpful to put that feeding in context. The disciples had come back to tell him all that they had done. They had been sent out on that limited commission. But the other piece of news that they brought to him was that Herod Antipas had just killed his cousin John the Baptist down at his black fortress. And what the other Gospels reveal is that hurt. And he was trying to get away to a desolate place to let them recharge and also for him to grieve the loss of his cousin. And so they came across the sea over here toward Bethsaida and the crowds saw that he was heading this way. And so they ran around the north side of the Sea of Galilee and beat him here. We need to appreciate the humanity of Jesus. He sees all of these people who aren't just there for the teaching, but he sees people that need help. They need healing. And it says that he had compassion on them. And so despite how he was feeling in the moment, he spent that day taking care of thousands of other people. And so Jesus, in this moment where he should have been grieving and having some privacy, was surrounded by thousands of people and still took the time to care for them, to heal them, and by the end of the day to miraculously feed 5,000 of them. And Jesus looks at Philip and asks Philip, where do we go and buy food for these people? And I think the reason he pointed Philip out was because Philip was from Bethsaida. Philip would know where to get food for these people. Philip's response is, we don't have the money to buy enough food for all these people. And of course, we know that he grouped them into specific groups and then asked for food. And one boy produced five loaves and two fish. So imagine, if you will, 5,000 people spread out across this plain right here. And Jesus performed the miracle where he was able to feed them all. Now, John's emphasis is that Jesus is actually able to miraculously produce food for people, very similar to the way that God produced manna for the Israelites in the Old Testament. And so, not just performing a miraculous sign, but that that sign pointed to the fact that he was connected to the Yahweh of the Old Testament. It would have reminded them of Moses and the wandering of the Israelites and the fact that God miraculously provided food and manna for them. This man from Nazareth is doing what happened in the days of Moses. And Moses prophesied that a prophet would come like him and they would have made that connection. After Jesus was rejected as Nazareth, he moved to Capernaum and really set up this city as kind of his home base for his ministry in this area. A lot of the miracles that are recorded in the gospel either took place here or just outside of here. When he walked across the Sea of Galilee at night, he was coming from the opposite side of the sea, coming toward Capernaum. And if he hadn't intercepted the boat, he would have passed by them and come here to this harbor. We mentioned the, the casting out of the demons into the swine. Well, that started here and stopped here. He took off from Capernaum, and then when he came back, he came back to Capernaum. Capernaum was a small village on the northern shore of the Sea of Galilee. It probably had a few hundred people in it. And given the miracles that are recorded for us in the Gospels of all the things that Jesus did there, obviously he would have been well known in the community. Anytime he came to Capernaum, people would have known about it. Now there are a lot of miracles that we could talk about, but there's one that I think is 
extra special. It's over in Luke chapter 8. And as Jesus is coming into town, Jairus, the ruler of the synagogue, has a daughter across town who is very, very ill. And so he sends word asking for Jesus to get to him and try to help his daughter. And as he comes through town, crowds start to surround him. And in the midst of all of that is when a woman who has had a flow of blood for 12 years and has been spending all of her livelihood, gone to all of these doctors to try to take care of that, comes up to Jesus and she just touches the edge of Jesus' garment. And as soon as she does that, she feels within herself that she's been healed. And Jesus stops and makes a comment about it and gives her opportunity to acknowledge what she's done. And in that interlude, the ruler's daughter actually dies. And by the time he gets there, the mourners are already there. But of course he goes in and he raises her. There's just so much about the facts in that miracle that testify to Jesus and who he is and how compassionate he is. You have this woman who for 12 years has been ceremonially unclean. It's hindered her ability to be social and she has exhausted every possible way to heal herself. She is hopeless. There is nothing left. She's so desperate that she's willing to try to sneak a miracle from Jesus because her condition is such that it's a very delicate matter. And what Jesus does at first glance seems kind of cruel. He draws attention to her. It says the crowd was kind of jostling him and he asks, who touched me? And his disciples are a little indignant. There are all these people. What do you mean, who touched you? When he mentions it again, she comes forward. She tells him everything that happened. And he says, go in peace. Your faith has made you well. And what he did, you think about her situation. If she had left that crowd without Jesus having done that, she would have felt like she had stolen something from God. And she wouldn't have been as apt to have shared the news about it. And she would have felt guilt over that. Instead, Jesus provided her an opportunity to be open and to come clean about it and to be more public with it and walk away feeling like she had been granted a gift not that she had taken anything. The way that he interacted with her was so compassionate. There's just so many details. I always think about that miracle when I think about Capernaum. But unfortunately, after him living there and doing so much, Capernaum is one of the towns that he pronounces a woe on when he's done with his ministry because it says they didn't believe, which is just so shocking to think, look at all that he said and all that he did in that spot and the town didn't believe. And I think that's a warning to us that we need to pay attention. And we need to make sure that we pay attention to what Jesus says and what he does so that we don't end up with the same woe pronounced upon us. actually driving through Cana. This is one of the two possible locations of the first miracle that Jesus did where he turned the water into wine at the wedding feast. The Gospels record that Cana is really where Jesus' ministry got started with that very first miracle. So what we saw at the Israel Museum was some large stone jars that were used for holding water for ritual purification. That's right. It was most likely that Jesus converted that water into wine in Cana. I don't think we have time to stop here today, but it's interesting still to drive through this area. It gives you a perspective of where it's located in relation to other cities and villages nearby. Visiting ancient Jericho, I really enjoy going there because you get a different perspective of the city. We hear about Jericho a number of times in the Bible. Outside of Jerusalem and maybe one or two other cities, it's mentioned more times than any other city in the Bible. On a clear day when there's no haze, you can stand on the tell and you can actually look across the Jordan Rift Valley and see Mount Nebo. Jericho is one of, if not the oldest, longest occupied cities in all of the world. And so there's just layer after layer after layer of historical events that took place there. 
It is blistering hot out here. Well, the thermometer says 103 degrees Fahrenheit, but that's because we're so far below sea level. At Jerusalem, we're about 2,700 feet above sea level. Mm -hmm. Here at Jericho, we're nearly 800 feet below sea level. We're down in the Jordan Rift Valley, and we're probably only five miles or so from the northern end of the Dead Sea. And this time of year, it gets really warm down here. We're here because we want to talk about one of Jesus' miracles. It's so powerful. In Mark, the 10th chapter, we actually read a scripture that says, And they came to Jericho, and as he was leaving Jericho with his disciples and a great crowd, Bartimaeus, a blind beggar, the son of Timaeus, was sitting by the roadside. But if you look over at Luke's account, it says in chapter 18, As he drew near to Jericho, a blind man was sitting by the roadside begging. So this appears at first glance to be a contradiction. Right. Mark tells the story and he says he was leaving Jericho, but Luke says he was coming to Jericho, so which is it? Well, actually it's both. During the first century, Jericho was divided into two different parts. Residential Jericho sat right around where we are right now. Administrative Jericho sat about a mile and a half to the southwest of us. This is where King Herod had his palace. So Mark is telling this story from a Jewish perspective as Jesus was leaving Jericho. Luke, on the other hand, is telling this from a Gentile perspective. As he was approaching Jericho, he's talking about administrative Jericho. And if you think about it, that makes sense. Because if you were a blind man, where would you want to be? Well, you would want to be on the road between the two parts of the cities where the most traffic is. He's placed himself on a crossroads. Besides just the logistics of the miracle itself, Jesus is on his way up to Jerusalem from Jericho, making his way toward that last Passover feast, his final week before he's crucified. And so anyone else, they'd be thinking a lot about themselves. He takes the time to heal one more person with a physical malady. Jesus already knew, I mean, he's the son of God. He already knew what the man's problem was, but he still gave him opportunity to identify it. Jesus asked him, what do you want me to do for you? And God wants to hear from us. He already knows what our problems are. He already knows what our struggles are, but he wants that level of communication with us too. He wants us to vocalize it and interact with him. Yeah. And Jesus gave him that opportunity. This man, when he recognizes that Jesus, the son of David, the king is coming, he cries out all the more loudly and identified him as a descendant of David, attaching the title of king to him. And Jesus responded by healing him on his way up to Jerusalem. The blind man Bartimaeus is one of my personal heroes in the Bible. This is a gentleman who knew he had a problem. He knew that there was only one person that could fix it and that's Jesus. And he wasn't gonna let anybody stand in his way. That's the approach that we should take with our lives. That's right. There's a wonderful story of Jesus having compassion on a blind man in John the ninth chapter, in which he tells the man to go down to the pool of Siloam and wash his eyes. It's a, just a beautiful place, and I just love the story. Now there's a picture that I have in my mind that I've seen since I was a kid, and it shows this pool of water off to the right and some stairs going up to the left. That's the image I've got stuck in my head. Was that accurate? For many, many years, there was a misunderstanding about exactly where the Pool of Siloam was located. This is actually the picture that you've seen. This is a picture of a pool that sat underneath a Byzantine church built around the 4th or 5th century. It's at the exit of Hezekiah's Tunnel, which comes out the western side of the eastern hill here in Jerusalem. And it wasn't until recently that they found the real Pool of Siloam. They found it while doing some excavations. They were digging for a sewage line in, in town, and what they found was a first century Roman Herodian style pool, and it was in the right area, so they knew they'd finally found the Pool of Siloam. During one of Jesus' trips to Jerusalem, his disciples saw a blind man and had the question, who sinned, this blind man or his parents, that he's blind? And Jesus, in answering their question, actually bent down, spit in some clay, rubbed it on the man's eyes, and sent him to wash. Now, where that miracle took place was somewhere in between here and there. Where are we walking? We are on a first century road that leads from the Temple Mount area behind us all the way down to the Pool of Siloam. We're about 15 or 20 feet underground, but they have excavated this just within the last couple years. And after he would have washed and realized that he was miraculously healed, he likely would have gone back to the temple. And it's possible he would have come back up this exact same road. This would have been the main road between the Pool of Siloam and the Temple Mount. As you get closer to the Pool of Siloam, they've uncovered more of the width of the road. So it's actually much wider in the first century than it is when we are walking on it. So if you can picture it at least six, seven, eight times wider than what we actually see, this was a major thoroughfare going through town. This is a beautiful artist representation of what the Pool of Siloam would have looked like in the first century. 
The pool is so much larger than I imagined it to be. I mean, it's almost the size of a swimming pool. Yeah. During the first century, especially among the Jewish people, there was a practice of ritual bathing before you did anything of a religious nature. And so there were a number of these pools or mikvahs around the area. And sometimes they were much larger, like the Pool of Siloam. And so this pool would have been a pool that people would have gone to to go through the practice of ritual bathing before they went up to the temple. Barry, we've come out of the tunnel and we look to be on some steps. So I'm assuming we've reached the Pool of Siloam. We have. This is an active dig site. They're still digging here. They're still doing a little construction here. They've only actually exposed one side of it. And what you have is the typical Herodian style with step, 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 flat area, and another few steps, another flat area. The rest of the Pool of Siloam, probably 90% of it actually sits behind us, but it's on private property. And that's good and bad. It's bad in the fact that we can't see it, mm -hmm. but it's good in the fact that we know it's there and it's protected. This pool, which is mentioned over in John 9 with the healing of a blind man, is a significant part of that event. You have this man who's been born blind and they want to know whose fault was that? Was it his parents or did he do something? Really similar to the question that Job's friends asked him in the Old Testament. Is there such a thing as innocent suffering? Is all suffering a direct result of someone's personal guilt? And Jesus' answer was no. It wasn't a result of him sinning. It wasn't a result of his parents sinning. We live in a world that's been broken by sin. And as a result of that, people get sick, there's disease, we see death, we see natural disasters. So it answers that question. I don't always suffer because of a direct result of my own personal sin. But I live in a world where it has been cursed. And even in the midst of that, God is able to be glorified in how we respond to that innocent suffering. It's a rich, rich text. It's powerful to think about what did he see for the first time as he came down to this pool and washed that clay away. All of a sudden he was able to see when for his entire life that was not possible. The rest of the chapter is just how everyone in this man's circle responds to the fact that he can see now. His neighbors have questions about it. The religious authorities have questions about it. They bring his parents in to ask them questions about it. And by the time you get to the end of the text, the point that John is making from the sign of the miracle, because all of the miracles were signs, this man who had physically been born blind was the one who spiritually saw Jesus for who he was, a righteous man who was able to work miracles. And the religious leaders who had physical sight were spiritually blind. They weren't able to recognize Jesus for who he was. So at the end of the chapter, they've rejected Jesus as the Son of God, and it's the blind man who's wanting to follow him. I love visiting the Pool of Siloam. Jesus has such compassion on people. To me, it's a vivid reminder of the love that Jesus has for everyone. Not only this blind man in the first century, but for me as well. We just left Jerusalem, the Pool of Siloam. Where are we heading? We're heading to the tomb of Lazarus in Bethany. This is a pretty significant miracle. I mean, he personally knows the people involved. The story even tells about how he wept. This was someone very close to him, but he used the opportunity to show the power of God in doing what he did. Have you been there before? I actually haven't been there before, so I'm looking forward to being there, but I've seen a number of pictures and a number of videos about it. We're probably gonna to have to get down on our hands and knees and crawl a little bit. And it's gonna be dimly lit, low clearance, and it should be a real adventure. I'm looking forward to being there. This is a difficult place to get to now. A number of years ago, they put up the separation wall between Jerusalem and Israel and the West Bank, and a lot of tourists don't come to this area anymore. We don't know exactly which tomb Lazarus was in, but we know that those tombs are first century tombs, so they're a good representation of what Lazarus would have been laid in when Jesus came to raise him from the dead. When Jesus heard it, he said, this illness does not lead to death. It's for the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. In this moment leading up to his triumphal entry and to his rejection and to his crucifixion, as he gets closer to Lazarus's tomb, everybody that he encounters is saying, if you had been here, you could have stopped this from happening. If you had been here, he wouldn't have died. He's already raised people from the dead. And so part of what Jesus is wrestling with as he approaches the tomb is, these people that I'm closest to still don't understand. And so when it says that he was greatly troubled, it's possible that what he was greatly troubled with was the people closest to him still didn't fully understand who he was, and that hurt him deeply, and he wept. When you get into the vestibule, there's a rectangular opening in the floor that gives you access to just two or three stairs and then you have to get on your hands and knees and crawl into the actual tomb area itself. 
Wow, Barry. This is really tight down here. It is. It's very stale air. It's not moving at all. No, we're probably 10, 15 feet underground here. It looks like over here there's a niche behind yeah. this block wall. You see people have left prayers written on pieces of notepaper. The entrance we took in is a 16th century entrance. They're saying the original entrance would have been in a different spot. That's right. But in one of these niches is where Lazarus's body would have been laid. Right. He would have been laid according to tradition over here on this side of the room here. Jesus would have been outside in the vestibule area when he called Lazarus to come forth. And of course, Lazarus rose from the dead and came out to meet Jesus. Now, Lazarus had been dead for multiple days. Jesus intentionally waited after he heard that he was sick to give him time to pass away. He knew what he was gonna do, even though the disciples didn't. And by the time he got here, one of his sisters was concerned about the odor that would have been there because he had been dead for four days. Now, according to Jewish tradition, one of the significant things about the four days is that Jews believe that after so many days of death, your spirit finally departed your body. And so for Jesus, he waited that long so that they would have had that understanding that his spirit was already gone. He was for certain dead before he called him out of the tomb. But Lazarus comes out and he doesn't look like someone who has been buried for four days. And so it astonished everybody. Now all of this is really significant, especially in John's gospel, because the raising of Lazarus happens in John chapter 11. In John chapter 13, you're into Jesus' final week. And so you have the raising of Lazarus leading up to the death burial and the resurrection of Jesus himself. So it wasn't just a miracle pointing toward his divinity, but it was a foreshadowing miracle about what would happen to Jesus himself. The raising of Lazarus was the event that really sent the Jews over the top, because once Lazarus was alive and he was being seen by people in the city, they wanted to quiet Jesus. The text even emphasizes that they were actually seeking opportunities to have Lazarus killed. So this man that had just been miraculously raised from the dead, they were ready to kill him again to get rid of him as evidence to Jesus. Right. And Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this on account of the people standing around that they may believe that you sent me. And when he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The man who had died came out, his hands and feet bound with linen strips and his face wrapped with a cloth. Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. You know, this is possibly one of the tightest spots that we've crawled through to get to see something, but it was so worthwhile to come down here. Following the chronology of Jesus' time on earth, he's foreshadowing his impending death, burial, and resurrection. If Jesus from Nazareth has the power over life and death, then death is not the end, and we have hope. After John the Baptist was arrested by Herod Antipas, he sent some of his disciples to Jesus with an interesting question. In Luke chapter 7 and verse 20, it says, When the men had come to him, they said, John the Baptist has sent us to you, saying, Are you the one who is to come? or shall we look for another? In that hour, he healed many people of diseases and plagues and evil spirits, and on many who were blind, he bestowed sight. And he answered them, go and tell John what you have seen and heard. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear. The dead are raised up, the poor have good news preached to them, and blessed is the one who is not offended by me. What Jesus did to encourage John the Baptist in that moment was to point to the fact that he was able to perform miracles to a degree and in a measure that no one else ever could. And the Gospels call those miracles in multiple places signs. Those signs pointed to something. From the very first sign that he performed in Cana, turning water to wine, to the raising of Lazarus, and eventually to the sign of his own resurrection, the miracles of Jesus point to the fact that he was the Son of God who came to die for us all.